So thank you, Daniel, for this nice introduction. Um, thank you for the invitation. And um, yeah, the, the, the organizers gave me this challenging title, the idea of the perfect pump. Um, I edit uh, for Fontan patients uh, because uh, I was working in this field for the last uh, two or three years. Um, and I have to admit from the very beginning, I hope you're not too disappointed. I don't have the idea of the perfect pump, but I will, uh, I will let you know the thoughts of an engineer who is working in, uh, in this field in the next few minutes. So just to set the stage, I guess you know that much better than I do, um, but Fontan patients, they lack a subpulmonary ventricle. So therefore, in contrast to the, to the healthy, circulator, healthy circulation, where you have two pressure sources, the left ventricle and the right ventricle, in the Fontan circulation, the right uh, pressure or the subpulmonary pressure source is missing. Therefore, um, the central venous pressure is ele elevated, which leads to this typical manifestation such as uh, lymphatic dysfunction, which leads in turn to the so-called failing uh, Fontan circulation. Uh, as we heard previously, it is expected that in most of the patients, the cardiovascular system uh, fails eventually at a certain time point. Um, interestingly, um, there were some predictions, um, at least for, I don't know what's wrong. Uh, there were some predictions for the uh, living uh, Fontan population, which is expected to double within the next uh, 20 years. Um, and as you know, heart transplantation remains uh, the only long-term treatment option for these patients at the moment. So there is actually an urgent uh, unmet medical need uh, for devices to improve, uh, to, to improve this treatment. Um, yeah, so, and the clinical need is that we need a device which is specifically tailored uh, for the carbopulmonary uh, support, and we need a hemocompatible device. Uh, intuitively, intuitively, as an engineer, I would say let's place a pump in, in the position uh, of the carbopulmonary uh, circulation um, and add as much pressure as necessary to normalize the hemodynamic uh, condition. Uh, the ideal time point for that is pretty unclear at the moment, but uh, we, one can hypothesize that uh, one should do that before the failing mechanisms such as uh, diastolic and systolic uh, dysfunction of the ventricle occurs. Uh, so we normalize the hemodynamic condition and prevent these uh, failing mechanisms to start. So we would need a real destination therapy, which needs to be better than current MCS systems in terms of uh, adverse events and so forth. Um, so, when I started to work in this field, I went to experts like you and asked them, so how does uh, this pump shall look like? And, of course, we hear the typical requirements. Uh, we want to have a minimal invasive implantation. We want to have small compact size because we want to implant it in pediatrics and adult patients. It needs to be fully implantable. It has to have an outstanding hemocompatibility. It has to be a real alternative to heart transplantation. Um, and the physiologic, it should uh, mimic the physiologic behavior, and since we have the urgent medical need, we need it by tomorrow. Um, so as an engineer, or first of all, we heard that previously that all the current existing devices, there are no real option for uh, destination therapy uh, for these patients uh, due to the adverse events, and since they are not designed for the cover pulmonary circulation. So therefore, there were a lot of smart scientists coming up with ideas, so mainly focusing on the first requirement, the minimal invasive one, and the designed devices which can be placed intravascularly. Um, however, none of these systems um, is designed for long-term support. So all of them are designed for acute, uh, acute uh, support. So there are other groups focusing on fully implantable pumps, even self-driven uh, pumps, uh, and uh, pretty large extravascular pumps, but none of these systems, at least in our opinion, uh, constitutes an option for long-term support due to size and hemocompatibility. Um, so we call that, that we have competing requirements. So uh, the requirement of small size, minimal invasive implantation, and the uh, requirement of outstanding hemocompatibility um, is kind of contradicting each other. Uh, other and uh, so there is no perfect pump, at least to my knowledge of the current available technology, we can't uh, build this pump. Uh, therefore, we have to find an optimal trade-off uh, between all these requirements, and that's why I want to change the title of my talk into the idea of a realistic pump for Fontan patients. Um, so we were working uh, at the University Children's Hospital uh, 
for the last two years on, on, uh, on such a pump. So, as an engineer, what we first want to know is uh, the geometric boundary conditions for such a pump. So how large uh, can the pump be and how do we connect it to the vessels? Uh, therefore, we investigated the TCPC geometries of 36 fontan patients. We measured diameters, volumes, all the angles. And in an interdisciplinary team together with surgeon, we then evaluated which pump system could be the best one to fit in there without adding additional volume, without uh, without 90 degrees angles of graft, which is, uh, which is definitely a, a risk for kinking. And actually we came up with a small extravascular pump with two inlets and two outlets, uh, pumping blood from the cable veins to the pulmonary arteries. Uh, once we came up with the, with the idea that we want to have such a pump, um, we performed virtual implantations with each iteration of the pump and the current uh, de device, I will show you later how it works, the current device adds only approximately four milliliters of additional volume into the uh, total cover pulmonary connection. Um, the other thing we want to know, uh, of course, uh, is in terms of requirements are for physiological requirements. Uh, for this purpose, we established an acute animal uh, model of the, of, uh, of the fontan circulation where we used the age cut, since at this time point we didn't have our pump yet. So we, we used, I'm sorry for that, uh, we used the h watt to bypass uh, the right heart. So, uh, f so we pumped blood with the h watt from the uh, cable veins uh, into the pulmonary artery. And what we learned from these experiments um, is that such a pump in cover pulmonary position is very powerful because we can di directly influence the venous return mechanisms. Uh, so we have uh, this increasing speed has a direct influence on the central venous pressure until suction occurs and cardiac output seems to be linearly related uh, to speed. So this is very powerful. On the other hand, if something is very powerful, it comes at a cost, uh, you have a huge risk for over and under pumping in, in, in these patients. So venous congestion and, uh, and, and under pumping of the systemic circulation. Um, so what we also learn from this experiment is that uh, this pump, it's in series with the cardiovascular system, not, not in parallel as uh, the usual uh, LVADs. Um, so you need to deliver a wide range of pump flows. So it has to pump like two liters per minute in a 10-year-old patient at rest, but also has to ramp up up to 10 liters per minute if someone performs physical activity. Therefore, we need a very pressure-sensitive uh, design. I will let you know a bit later on what that means. So how does the pump look like? Uh, we have, as I mentioned already, we have two inlets and two outlets. I also brought the first prototype with me. It's uh, this size at the moment. You can take a look at it later on. Um, we have two inlets, uh, connecting to connect, uh, which are connected to the cable veins, two outlets connected to the pulmonary arteries. Uh, the, the impeller is borne by two uh, high-end ceramic bearings. We have a redundant motor design because this pump has to be fail-safe. So we have two electric motors in there. Uh, the impeller is a four-bladed uh, design to achieve a very smooth flow field, and around the impeller um, we have very large gaps, so they're at least half a millimeter, which is quite large for blood pumps, because we want to prevent the floating thrombi coming from the venous system to be stuck in the pump, because this would be a critical uh, adverse event if, if they clog in the pump. Um, and of course, the, the housing, uh, we have connect connectors for vascular grafts, uh, which, can be, which can then be connected to the vessels. Um, so in terms of female compatibility, um, the risks are blood trauma or thrombogenicity or uh, thrombus formation inside the pump. So we used flow simul simulations um, and we saw that we have pretty smooth uh, flows uh, through the pump, through the entire operating range from 2 to 10 liter, which was actually not easy to achieve. Um, and we have very low blood trauma compared to conventional elverts because the energy we need to transfer to the cardiovascular system is much lower. Uh, Within, within the pump, we have no region of low velocities and actually one of, of, one of the most risky regions are mechanical bearings. So uh, we, we performed a lot of tests or put a lot of effort in there uh, to have a well-washed mechanical bearing, uh, even at low flows at 2 liters up to 10 liters, because uh, it is well known that if the flow around the mechanical bearing is disturbed, uh, then there's a risk for pump thrombosis. Um, another issue about hemocompatibility is temperature. So especially if you go into miniaturization, you need to miniaturize your motors. And if you miniaturize the motor, you usually lose a lot of energy, and this energy is transferred into, uh, into temperature. 
Um, so together with the ETH Zurich, we designed several motors. We measured uh, their resistive losses or the motor losses, and then we simulated the theoretically um, uh, generated temperature. And even for the worst case scenario, so with the worst motor, with the highest uh, energy uptake, um, we have a temperature increase of less than 1.5 uh, uh, degrees of centigrade, um, which fulfills all the norms and standards uh, for implantable uh, assist devices. Um, as I mentioned previously, in terms of physiology, uh, we need to have a very pressure-sensitive pump. That means if the venous return increases, also the flow through the pump should increase, and there shouldn't be uh, a hydraulic resistance to the venous return. Uh, so what we did in our design process, we used 3D printing technologies. So we, we printed several rotors, uh, se several housings, and we had this nice device where we could uh, investigate the so-called HQ curve, so the characteristics, the hydraulic characteristics of the, of the pump, and we designed it in a way that they are very flat. So a low increase of central venous pressure results in an increase in flow. Um, also, what was very important to us is that the, uh, that the pressure conditions in the IVC and the SVC are balanced. Also in case of uh, physical activity, so if the patient starts to perform exercise, there will be much more flow from the lower body than from the upper body. body. And it's uh, still very important that the brain is perfused in an accurate way. So uh, we investigated the, the performance of the pump to balance uh, the pressures, and we saw that even at eight liters per minute, uh, the, the, the delta P between the IVC and the SVC is less than 1.5 millimeters of mercury. And finally, uh, for the hydraulic behavior, um, in case of a pump stop, the pump shouldn't, uh, should not stop the circulation. So the resistance of the pump should be, should be low. So and, uh, with our pump at the moment, we, we have uh, approximately five millimeters of mercury resistance at four liters per minute. So we hope that this is uh, sufficient for the patient to be transferred to the hospital and, uh, uh, until an intervention can be uh, performed. So uh, finally, some, something uh, we like to forget at university when we design pumps is also it needs to be manufactured at a certain time point. So um, our pump, all the parts of our pump are manufactured and the first, pro pro first prototypes are built. Uh, we use high-end ceramics, medical grade titanium, uh, yeah, and currently we are at the stage of assembling them. So I want to conclude. Uh, we believe that we have a promising device for carbopulmonary support, we're working on a, a promising device uh, which comes with the possibility of long-term support in contrast to the catheter-based uh, methods, which are more for the, for the acute ones. Um, and we are smaller than similar or than the Berlin Heart X-Core, for example, and also similar uh, devices which are, which are under uh, development. Yeah, and we fulfill the basic requirements for the long-term use. So an outlook. Uh, what we are working at at the moment is at the same size of the pump, we want to have a fully magnetically levitated pump. So actually, in theory, this works already. It was on a test bench. We have a, uh, the ETH, actually, they're working on that. Um, so they have a fully magnetic levitated rotor. Um, with the TU Berlin, we have probably the largest test stand for the small pump worldwide, and the most accurate one, so where we can uh, really uh, play around and uh, optimize the hemocompatibility of the pump. The next steps are chronic animal models and, of course, TET system, because our pump also uh, requires less power than, uh, than LVET, so uh, probably it's uh, easier to realize with our system. Thank you for your attention.